Hello, hello, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today for OESIS webinar. We're so thrilled to have a strategic partner, MITRE, here to, to be discussing privacy challenges and the future of privacy. My name is Lynn Dome, and I'm Women in Cybersecurity Executive Director. We often go by our acronym, WICYS, and it's spelled W I C Y S. We pronounce it we sis, like we sisters, because that's exactly what we are. We are a global cyber sisterhood. So our mission is to recruit, retain, and advance women in cybersecurity. We have over 6,200 members with representation in over 70 countries. In addition to that, we have over 50 professional affiliates, which are mini WESIS organizations. And they're all throughout Africa, Australia, Canada, France, India, Pakistan, the UK, and throughout the United States. We have specialty affiliates like artificial intelligence, critical infrastructure, cloud security, data privacy and cybersecurity law, colors of inclusion, LGBTQ plus pride, neurodiversity, military, BSO, and so many more. And then on top of all that, we have 214 student chapters with Microsoft Philanthropies funding a big global student chapter initiative for us to reach 20 more countries. But what we do is we create opportunities and we have many different initiatives we have an online members forum where all our members can network and connect. We have skill development training programs that are funded by Google, Bloomberg, Meta, Craig Newmark Philanthropies. We have AWS that builds out a roadmap for us, uh, Fortinet, SANS Institute, ISC Squared, and so many more. We offer scholarships, grants, and awards not only to our conference that's coming up March 16th through the 18th in Denver, Colorado, but to other conferences as well. We have our Cyber Talent Emergency Fund for students that are in financial distress to be able to apply and receive up to $599 within 48 hours that have true financial emergencies, like their car broke down, or they can't afford rent, or they need extra money for tuition. Whatever the case may be, we don't want that little bit of money to be a burden on them to hold them back from their cyber studies. We have speaking and media opportunities so everyone can be what can see what you are, and that's the cybersecurity professionals that we have within our organizations. And on top of all that, our job board plus plus is where strategic partners like MITRE recruit from year round. We have apprenticeships, internships, market research, leadership summits, leadership series. We have a speakers bureau, a mentor mentee program. That program is going to be open for enrollment again in February. And we designed a curriculum to upskill and up level women, no matter where they're at in their careers, preparing them for the next level of advancement. We have all that and so much more. So I encourage you to go to wieses.org and check us out. And a special thanks to our strategic partners, MITRE, that brings us today's webinar. And then our tier one partners, AWS, Battelle, Bloomberg, Carnegie Mellon Software Engineering Institute, Cisco, Fortinet, Google, Intel, Lockheed Martin, Meta, Microsoft, Optum, Sandia National Labs, and Sentinel One. So you can see this list. We have a robust group of partners that are completely invested in the inclusion and diversity efforts of the cybersecurity workforce. And we're so grateful to have them a part of our community. So today we're discussing privacy challenges in the future of privacy. And we have incredibly talented experts here from MITRE. This is your opportunity as audience participants to please ask your questions. They will be answered live all throughout the webinar. And at the end, we'll also have a Q&A section. So at the bottom of your screen, you see this chat and just put your questions in there. We'll take it away. And if you haven't done so already, please subscribe to the WESIS newsletter. That way you'll never miss a beat of all things of the WESIS org. You'll get updates and newsworthy items um, weekly on uh, different areas you could participate. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and pass the mic on over to Julie to take it away from here. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak today. I'm Julie McEwen. I am a principal cybersecurity and privacy engineer, and I lead the privacy capability at the MITRE Corporation in MITRE Labs. Um, two, my two colleagues, Kathy Pedrozino and Megan McCarthy, work with me. And today we're going to talk a bit about privacy challenges and the future of privacy. A bit more about the company we work for. MITRE is a nonprofit company. It manages federally funded research and development company, or, sorry, research and development centers for federal government agencies. 
And we also have a WESIS affiliate group, and that group helps us to enhance the WESIS mission and work in cybersecurity and privacy areas. Our president of our affiliate is Michaela Adams. And so next, I'd like to introduce each of our speakers a bit. As I mentioned, I lead the privacy capability at MITRE Labs at MITRE. And I've been at MITRE for over 23 years. I've been doing work in cybersecurity and privacy for over 40 years and have done work in private industry as well as in the government and in um, both the public and private sectors. Uh, next, Megan, you want to introduce yourself? Absolutely. Hello, everybody. I'm Maggie McCarthy. I'm also a principal cybersecurity and privacy engineer and group lead at MITRE Corporation. Have not been at MITRE as long as Julie, but have been here for already seven years. And I'm also part of the privacy capability leadership team, leading, also leading projects and privacy tasks for many of our federal sponsors. Um, before MITRE, I spent many years with some of the big four consultancy firms, also helping federal sponsors with privacy and cyber strategy, risk, workforce, organizational resiliency, and engineering, and even spent some time over in the financial uh, sector where I was a governance manager and privacy champion. So happy to be here and talk with you all today. Okay, great. And Kathy Petruzzino, um, Kathy was having trouble with their mic. Is it working now? No, not hearing anything. So um, hopefully we'll get that working for Kathy. Kathy is another colleague who is working in uh, uh, the leadership team for her privacy capability. And I know she too, like me, has worked in private industry, the public and private sectors in, in a lot of different areas. So the areas we're going to cover today, just a few topics. We're gonna to start by talking about privacy concepts and then talk a bit about global privacy perspectives, which can vary depending on where you are in the world. We'll talk about privacy and technology and also about privacy engineering, which is a lot of what we do at MITRE. And then we'll talk a bit about working with privacy. And Megan's gonna start us off by talking about some of the privacy concepts. Megan, go ahead. Great, thanks, Julie. Um, so the couple of slides I'm gonna run everyone through really just helps everyone who's maybe not in the depths of privacy like we have been um, understand privacy a little bit better. So the first slide is what is privacy? So privacy is a right we hold all, we all hold dear in many forms. We want to know that we have the right to privacy within our own homes and can live our lifestyles the way we choose. So we also want to make sure that companies, doctors, government, whoever it is that's collecting our, our personal information isn't mishandling it or sharing it in a way that we do not want them to. So the clear definition of privacy in the simplest form is the ability of individuals like you and I to exercise control over the collection, use, and dissemination of your personally identifiable, identifiable information, or PII. And we'll dig into that a little, what PII is a little bit in a couple slides. Uh, the U.S. Constitution doesn't explicitly state that the U.S. citizens have a fundamental right to privacy, but it is implied in a couple of the amendments. So under the First Amendment, the people of the U.S. have a series of basic freedoms on how they can express themselves, which typically relates to freedom of speech, freedom of the press, and freedom of religious expression. And in turn, this creates an assumption that we have a constitutional right to carry out our lives with privacy. Under the Fourth Amendment, no one can search possessions and property without good reason or warrant again, privacy, and other amendments like the 14th Amendment states the protection of personal freedoms and the 9th Amendment states protection of rights not mentioned in the Constitution are also important when creating new laws to protect rights to privacy and personal beliefs. Finally, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which is a milestone document in the history of human rights drafted by representatives with different legal and cultural backgrounds from all regions of the world states that no one shall be subject to arbitrary interference with privacy, family, home, or course finance, nor to attacks upon his honor and reputation. So that is what privacy in a very small nutshell is. So now let's dig into what PII is. PII is any data that can be used to identify someone, whether directly or indirectly. So some examples of directly being able to identify someone using PII is things like your social security number, your driver's license number, your, your name full or partial, your biometrics, things that are unique to, to you as an individual. Indirectly, PII can be uh, information that when combined, combined being the key word there, with other information identifies an individual. So for example, if you combine the date, birth, zip, the date of birth, zip code, and gender, there's a high likelihood that you can identify an individual. And actually in 2010, there was a study that 
those three combinations can actually identify over 85% of the US population. So that's a pretty big deal. Um, PII is also information that is about an identified individual. So your health records, your financial information, or your protected health information, or your personal financial information are all forms of PII. One other thing to point out on this slide is that, especially in the era of big data, where we can identify analyze vast quantities of data regardless of its source, location, or purpose, being able to easily correlate data to identify an individual becomes a huge privacy challenge. Now that we've talked about privacy and what PII is, let's talk about what is being done to protect it. The FIPS, or the Fair Information Privacy Principles, are a widely accepted framework that is the core of the Privacy Act of 1974 and is mirrored in the laws of many US states, as well as many foreign nations and international organizations. FIPS are a set of eight principles that you can see on the slide and form the basis for compliance policies and procedures governing the use of PII. So we'll go around the circle here just to give you a little quick nugget of what each of these principles are. So the first one we have on the list is transparency, and that's really just being transparent and providing notice on how you're gonna use an individual's PII. The next is individual participation. It's involving the individual in the process of using their PI and seeking consent for the use of that PII. And you have purpose specification, is you really wanna articulate the purpose or the purposes for which you're collecting the PII and planning to use it. Data minimization is sounds what it is, is only collecting PII that is directly relevant and necessary to accompl accomplish the specified purposes. So don't collect data more than you need to. Use limitation is using PII solely for the purpose it was collected. Data quality and integrity, ensuring your PII is accurate, relevant, timely, and complete. Security, we wanna protect the PII using our security safeguards. And finally, accountability and auditing is complying with all these principles, providing training to make sure people know how to comply, and then auditing the compliance and making sure that people are demonstrating it. It is also important to point out that in some of these environments, particularly like law enforcement intelligence, opportunities for access and amendment and individual participation are often extremely limited as it can lead to compromising top secret investigations. So that's a topic for another day, but there are situations. On this next slide, we've talked a little bit about privacy and FIPS to protect our privacy and PI, but why is this important? What's at risk when privacy is violated and how can you determine what could cause a privacy problem? On this slide are processes or activities that could lead to privacy harms. So you'll see across the top, these are different activities or processes and underneath are each of the different harms. So the first one, information collection, a person might think, oh my goodness, they're collecting information about what I'm doing more than they should. So the types of harms that this could create is surveillance, someone watching or recording your activities, or interrogation, inappropriately probing for information. The next one is information processing, where a person might think, man, they have a lot of data about me and they're storing, manipulating, and using it. So the harms that could come from that is aggregation, combining pieces of information about an individual, secondary use, using that information for a purpose different than what it was collected for, and exclusion, using that data to exclude an individual, especially if the information is incorrect. Next, we have information dissemination, where an individual might think, oh man, they spread or transfer information about me more than I think they should. And this can lead to breach of confidentiality, breaking an agreement to keep information confidential, disclosure, disclosing data to persons or entities the individual doesn't expect, exposure, revealing intimate information as in a public exposure of private facts, increased accessibility, amplifying the accessibility of information, and appropriation, or what others probably know this as identity theft. Finally, there's invasion, um, which includes decisional interference, with entering into an individual's decisions regarding his or her private affairs, or unwanted email or phone calls, unwanted communications into an individual's personal space, including email or phone. So what are the consequences of what we've discussed so far? People lose trust is one of the top ones. 
um, especially in organizations or relationships where PIA has been misused? Would you want to work with, give business to, or be friends with someone who has lost your trust? So definitely that loss of confidence, credibility, and trust in organizations. The next one is negative impacts on individuals. Identity theft and financial fraud is a stressful consequence, especially in cases of data breaches that include your social security number. Insurance increases can happen, especially when the wrong hands get a hold of your PHI and see your underlying medical conditions. An embarrassment, think of a time when you had a personal conversation and that string of messages was shared with an audience in which you gave no consent. And also harassment, when personal information about you is used in a demeaning manner and without your consent, and especially as women, online sexual harassment is an unfortunate known example. Um, financial loss or large costs, especially for organizations who have a large data breach. You hear about them on the news all the time and the costs are very significant. And then reduced effectiveness for organizations. And for all the con other consequences listed that we just talked about, your organization won't be effective if you're trying to play cleanup because of your poor privacy. So with that, I'm going to pass the baton back to either Julie or... Is Kathy out able to join? Okay, I'll go ahead and brief the next few slides talking about global privacy perspectives. So what you see on this slide is a map that shows the different areas of the world and how intense the um, privacy laws and enforcement are for particular areas. Everything that you see in red means that there's a lot of privacy laws and a lot more attention being paid to privacy. Um, when you see orange or yellow, it's less robust and limited are the green areas. Um, so you see in, in North America in particular, we have a lot of very good privacy laws and protection. Also in Europe, very strong there, Australia, some parts of um, Asia. Um, but you'll see there's quite a bit of the world that does not have the same type of protection. It's important to note that privacy is addressed differently throughout the world. And a lot of this is because of the social influences on privacy. Different parts of the world have different social values and they might have a different history that influences how they see privacy. For example, in Europe during World War II in particular, there was a lot of use of information that caused a lot of harm to individuals through the war. And as a result, they pay a lot more attention to privacy and really do see it very strongly as a human right. Here in the US, it's more of a consumer right and viewed quite differently. So privacy laws and approaches will vary between countries. And this is something that's very important to understand if you work in privacy, depending on where you're working or who you're working with, privacy might be handled very differently. In the US in particular, there's no one overarching privacy law that handles privacy in the government and in private industry. And legislation is very much driven by need. So you'll see laws out there for privacy that are based on the characteristics of the custodian rather than the data. For example, HIPAA or the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. I think most of us have heard about this law. It's the law that you will typically hear when you go to the doctor's office and they give you a set of privacy um, practices for you to review and let them know that you looked at them. So those are to let you know that they're complying with this particular law. And it's co the covered entities there are government, or, I'm sorry, doctors and medical service providers and also health insurance organizations and um, corporations who manage um, healthcare. Um, so it's a very narrow law and it has very specific covered entities. Then there's the gram leach Bliley Act, which is, covers uh, financial institutions. And that's the law that um, when you receive those annual privacy notices in the mail from your credit bureau, or I'm sorry, your credit card companies or your banks, those are required under Graham Leach Bliley to let everyone know what their privacy practices are. And then there's COPPA, the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act. This is a law that requires website operators to specifically pay attention to the privacy of children's information when they're using their websites. And this is applicable to children who are under the age of 13. Then in the private sector, in addition, we have one organization in the federal government that oversees privacy, and that's the Federal Trade Commission. So what they do is they look for 
unfair and deceptive practices among organizations in their handling of information about individuals, and then you know give them particular um, uh, sanctions and things that they have to do if they're not meeting what the FTC sees as being appropriate based on laws and guidance. There's also privacy laws that are specific only to federal government agencies, and those include the Privacy Act of 1974. It's a really old law, but it's still in effect. And it's kind of hard to apply it now to the systems of systems and networks of networks that we have, but it is something that still government agencies have to use to manage how personal information is used throughout their organizations. There's also the E-Government Act, which once again only applies to federal government agencies, and that requires them to do privacy impact assessments for their systems and to mitigate the risk for those systems regarding privacy. The Office of Management and Budget in the federal government, or OMB, oversees federal agency privacy in general. And states also have their own privacy laws, and there's been quite a few passed in the last few years. One notable one is the California Consumer Privacy Act, or CCPA, which actually was modeled a lot over some of the European Union laws, especially the General Data Protection Regulation, GDPR, which we'll talk a bit more about later in the presentation. Next, talk a bit about privacy and technology. This is a key area where we do work at MITRE. It's really important, especially if you're working in cybersecurity, to understand that cybersecurity and privacy are distinct disciplines, but they are mutually supportive. There are things about privacy, though, that are unique to privacy. If you have cybersecurity in place, that doesn't cover everything. Cybersecurity in particular protects information and systems from loss of confidentiality, integrity, and availability. And those are the three main tenets that we think about when we think of cybersecurity, especially for confidentiality. It's, it's making sure there's no unauthorized access to information. Integrity, making sure there's no unauthorized changes to information. And then availability, making sure that your systems are available at all times and that you can get to the data and use it in the ways you want to. On the privacy side, we're not as focused in those areas. We're more focused on protecting information about individuals from inappropriate or, or unauthorized collection, use, disclosure, and also retention. So those are the areas that Megan talked about when she briefed on the fair information practice principles. But they do support each other. In many cases, privacy looks to cybersecurity to provide different security mechanisms to protect data. And cybersecurity looks to privacy to give them an idea about what the sensitivity level is of personally identifiable information and who can have access to it. So the two need to work together very closely to be an effective team and manage data appropriately. In terms of privacy impacts of emerging technologies, there are many, and many of the new technologies we've seen in many cases have some privacy considerations to them. On the left-hand side, you see a list of the types of technical approaches that have privacy considerations. These are areas that when we work in privacy are almost like a red flag to us. For example, if we see an application that is using geolocation tracking, we automatically know there's going to be some privacy considerations there because anybody's geolocation is a type of personally identifiable information. And in some cases, it could be very sensitive. So we pay attention when there's geolocation being used. And we do strive to help people who are developing systems and designing them to not use geolocation unless they absolutely need it. And then there's also things like audio, video, or photographic image use. And this includes things like facial recognition. Facial recognition has been a huge issue in many organizations and for um, applications where they're looking at using it that can cause a lot of problems. Uh, also partially because it may not be totally accurate, but in addition, it may create bias. So this is something that we also look at when we see facial re recognition being used that we know there's gonna be some privacy issues. We also see issues with biometrics and that includes things like fingerprints, or eye retina scans, um, any type of um, physical characteristic about an individual. Um, so something else that we look for in privacy is when we see those used, there's going to be privacy issues. Artificial intelligence and machine learning are areas that are also have a lot of privacy concerns. Once again, there can be bias there when you're developing an artificial intelligence system. 
There can also be concerns about lack of diversity of information or information being used inappropriately. There's a lot of things to consider in, in privacy and AI and ethics also fall into play there. And privacy and ethics also have a strong relationship. Then there's also the internet of things. And we'll talk in a minute about some examples of those types of applications, but the internet of things, there are all kinds of devices connected to the internet that may have PII in them that create privacy issues. And then there's also cloud systems. I think a lot of us are familiar with the cloud that a lot of data gets stored in the cloud. The cloud um, service providers can sit in various places around the world, so they might be subject to different laws and that can impact how well privacy is protected with data. On the right-hand side, we have examples of current and possible future applications where there could be privacy considerations. Just a few examples, there's many more. First, social media, obviously, there's a lot of PII in social media. One of the things that we run into a lot as privacy professionals is that people assume that because data in social media has been posted publicly, they assume it's okay to do whatever they want with it. That's not necessarily the case. Ethically, especially for a corporate organization, you shouldn't be taking social media data and just doing with it whatever you want. It still needs to be protected. It's still about an individual and still should be used appropriately. Also, we've done work at MITRE with connected vehicles, smart cars. There's a lot of data that gets collected as you're using a vehicle that can be about you. So there's PII involved. And there's also considerations there about surveillance and tracking that you could follow an individual's car and know exactly where they're at and what they're doing based on the information that the vehicle gives you. There's also voice assistance. So anything that you, um, any of those that you use like Siri can have all kinds of implications for privacy. There's contact tracing, which we saw a lot of with COVID-19 in particular coming into play. There's fitness trackers, which carry both health and personal, other types of personal information in them. Identity management, um, any type of way that you log into a system or that you share your identity through the use of different systems can create privacy issues. There's also issues with privacy regarding behavioral surveillance. For example, um, there are systems where they are trying to determine how to help people with some of their um, psychological problems or some of the questions about their personality. And all that is very much sensitive to individuals. And then there's inference-based social sorting, where you're sorting information based on social aspects of an individual, and there can be privacy implications there as well. So a lot of things to consider here and many other examples that we can give you. Next, I'll talk a bit about privacy engineering. And this is also another key area where we do work at MITRE. Many of us who work in our capability are privacy engineers. So what does that mean? Basically, we're trying to make sure that privacy gets designed into systems and applications from the very beginning. The whole concept of privacy by design is what privacy engineering implements. And privacy by design advances the view that privacy can't be assured solely by some of the regulatory frameworks that are out there. It has to be your default mode of operation and you need to include it in all of your activities, including how you design your technology, how you do your business practices, and then the physical design associated with your systems. So all of that comes together to include privacy from the beginning. It's really smart to not add privacy at the end. If you try to do that, it could often cost more money to do so, or it may be less effective because the system may have already been designed in a way where privacy can't be added. This is a very important area. So a bit more about privacy engineering. A lot of times we get questions from people, they wonder, so how do you decide what needs to be put into the system? And of course, privacy engineering, we really just don't pull those requirements out of the air. We rely very much on privacy foundational concepts. So a lot of things that Megan was talking about earlier in the presentation are what go into privacy engineering. We start by looking at privacy laws and regulations. We look at the fair information practice principles. We look at different privacy frameworks and standards that are out there. We always take into account ethical considerations in our work. So once again, there's a linkage between privacy and ethics. And we also look at privacy risk models, including social considerations. And so we add all that and we include the organizational mission. So if we're working with a particular federal government agency or a particular private industry organization, what is their particular mission and how does that figure into privacy? 
So we add that in there. We look at their privacy activities and we add that to their system privacy activities. And all together, we look at how to mitigate privacy risk. What are the things that we can do, the actions we can take to make privacy work for that particular technology or system or application? And the result are systems that fully address all the privacy risk requirements. So it's, it's not an easy area to work in, but it's very, very interesting. And there's a lot to it, as you can see from the slide. In our work at MITRE, that you might, might be uh, wondering, what exactly do we do with privacy? So there are a few things that we do. One is privacy research. We have several privacy research projects in place right now. They're doing some really interesting groundbreaking work. One is we're developing a taxonomy for privacy threats, something that's never been done before. We know that there's taxonomies out there for security, but not necessarily for privacy. So we're definitely working on developing that and hope to have that out in a um, model that can be used within the next couple of years. We're also looking at developing a data de-identification process architecture. There are a lot of different ways to de-identify data, but we found that organizations don't always know how to start or which way to pick. And so this process architecture will help them with that. And we're also working on a repeatable method for measuring privacy ex expectations. Because of all the different ways that privacy is viewed around the world, you will find very different expectations. And they're on a continuum. You'll find people who really don't care about privacy at all. They're an open book and they'll tell everybody everything and they just really aren't concerned about it. All the way to the other end of the spectrum where there are people who don't want to share anything about themselves. Most people run somewhere in the middle. But finding a way to measure those expectations and put them into systems is very important. So we're working on that. We've also developed some privacy engineering tools, which you see on the bottom left there, including a framework to use for privacy engineering, a maturity model to help you figure out how to mature your privacy program within your organization, and then also some generic system privacy requirements and tests so you know how to test your systems for privacy. And then the kinds of work we do for our government sponsors, we help them to develop their privacy programs, we work with them on data de-identification and in privacy enhancing technologies. So putting things in place that can help enhance how privacy is done in their organization. We also look at threat management and we've helped with addressing privacy incidents that have happened. We do a lot of privacy engineering. We work on identifying privacy metrics to measure organizations and programs by. We also have helped develop privacy strategies and governance and policies that work along with technology aspects of privacy. And we've done studies on privacy workforce and how to make the workforce better, what type of training they need, and how to structure different organizations. So basically, um, and so it's, it's a very exciting and interesting area to work in. So now we'll talk a bit more about working with privacy and some of our personal perspectives on this. And I will start this off by talking about privacy at the doctor's office. This is an area that um, I often get questions about. People don't know quite what they should share, what they shouldn't share. So when you go to the doctor's office, often you get there and, and many times you get asked for your social security number. And a lot of people have asked me, should I give it or shouldn't I? My response is there's really no reason for your doctor to have your social security number. And it's an important part of just assessing how sensitive is this information about you and do they really need it? So if I have a doctor who asks me for that, if they ask me at the reception desk, I just decline to give it. I've never had an issue with that. Usually a lot of times they'll ask for it, they'll put it on a form and it's just like a generic thing to them, but it doesn't mean they, mean they necessarily need it for the work that they do. So I will tend to just say no, and I don't have an issue with that. So in general, it is important though, to remember that and think about when somebody asks you for your information, is it appropriate to give it to them? Also, the other thing I would highly recommend when you're at your doctor's office is they will often give you a notice of their privacy practices. And as I mentioned earlier, this is required under HIPAA to give you that information. Definitely read it. A lot of times they'll make you sign a statement saying that you did read it, it's important to look at that and understand what information they're collecting about you, what they're going to do with that information. Like, do they, you know, use it just for health or are they doing other things with it, like research? Um, who they're going to share it with? Are they just going to share it with your 
um, insurance company? Or are they going to share it with other doctors? You should have to give them permission to share it with anybody else that's additional. So look for those types of things in the statement. I know sometimes they're kind of full of legalese and a little difficult to read, but I always do read them. And I highly recommend you take a look at that. Next is a little bit about handling awkward privacy situations. So I'll give you a couple of examples. Oh, yeah. Kathy, you there? <laughs> I think so. Okay, great. Do you want to cover handling awkward situations? Yes, okay. I do. Um, so, so handling awkward handling situations, awkward. Every, I think each of us, maybe weekly, monthly, is asked for personal information that may, may not be clear to us is it necessary? And so, uh, you know, what I have found, I mean, I've had it happen to me at the grocery store where they're asking me for information and I just push back. I ask why, what are they going to be using it for? Um, and oftentimes they really don't know why it's just some type of policy and they don't know why. And you just say, well, I prefer not to give it to you. Uh, that's easy enough. Um, or, you know, it, it just turns out that you have a decision to make whether or not if they're going to be um, uh, stubborn and say, well, you can't get the service or whatever, unless you share this information, then you have a choice not to share the information, which may mean you, you may not get the service. What I've found also what's been very interesting and um, among some people uh, is that instead of withholding the information or asking, they simply will provide the wrong information. So um, I, I don't know how many people who are listening have, for example, given a fake name or a fake birthday. I know among my children, uh, that is seems to be common practice when it comes to social media. Um, and, you know, that is that is one approach. I think the the question is whether or not you may be technically um, violating some type of agreement because you aren't being truthful in terms of the information you're given. Now, I can understand where you know some people would say, "Well, they don't care," and uh, you know there's a 99.99 percent chance that it, n it never will matter. But it is just a it's good to know that if there is an agreement and you're violating it, just to, it's good to be aware of it. Um, the other problem is that, you know, without pushing back, the organization doesn't get the message that um, th what they're asking for is problematic, that they're asking for too much information, um, given you just want something relatively simple. But meanwhile, they're they're asking for a great deal of demographic information. It can be, um, you know, you want them, the organization to get the message that uh, you aren't comfortable sharing it. And uh, fortunately, with some of the laws that have passed, um, this this has become easier as the years have gone on. Um, GDPR and CCPA, which we'll be discussing a little bit later, they. Um, actually require uh, not only that organizations be more transparent about what they're doing with the information and that the information they're collecting uh, to the uh, minimization point that Megan made earlier, that it be relevant for the business purpose at hand. They also provide the data subject, um, whoever provides that information with access to that information and the ability to you know, request their information, understand um, who's been using it, request to delete it, um, there's the right to be forgotten, et cetera. So, you know, basically uh, stand up as an individual. The more of us that stand up, the better. And hopefully the organizations will get the message. And, um, you know, it, it, there is this whole concept of, you know, the individual being the product, right? If you don't pay for a service, then you are the product. And there is certainly some reality to that. So anyhow, that that is some thoughts about handling awkward privacy situations. So Megan, do you want to talk about kids and privacy? 
Yes, something near and dear to my heart with young children in elementary school. So I get to talk to you today a little bit about kids and privacy. And I was actually having a conversation about this this morning with one of my projects. And what is the right level to educate these kids on privacy and security? So like, like most of you probably on this call, protecting children's privacy has always been important to all of us, but it's become even more important and complicated, especially in this digital age. Um, for the, I'm really dating myself now, but when I was back, back when I was a kid, we were always taught never talk to strangers, tell them where you live or get in, your, in their vehicle just because they offered you candy. It was simple enough back then, right? And just don't go and get in people, strangers' cars. But what's happening now is we're, we're, we have a generation of children that is growing up online and events like COVID have only expedited the pace and age in which the kids are getting online. So for example, my kindergartner was online given a computer, having never touched a computer before with a password, and suddenly he's going to have to figure that out. That was a fun experience. Um, but with kids engaging online, this idea of never talk to strangers has become more complicated when everything online captivates kids to talk to strangers. YouTube, you can comment with strangers. Games, you can interact with strangers. Social media sites like TikTok, you can post videos that reveals a lot to strangers. Um, and a fun story about my eight-year-old is he came home from school last year and he asked if he could friend me on Pinterest. And I was like, what are you talking about, friend you? And he said, I created a Pinterest account. I want to friend you. And I said, well, how the heck did you create a Pinterest account? And he said, oh, I used my school email. <laughs> so just like that, he suddenly had a social media account, though not maybe the scariest, but it's still a way for him to share his personal information. And he has no idea what to do and how to do that. Um, uh, an interesting study and that I found was that the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, there was a 97.5 increase in online enticement reports in 2020. And 98% of the reported offenders were people that victims that victims have never met online, have never met before online, or they only met online. So it's a really scary world out there, especially online with our children. So what can we do about it? And privacy is what we can do. So we need to really be teaching our kids about privacy and why it's important. Why should they care about it? And what should they do to, to maintain privacy while they're especially online or even outside with their friends or at schools? Um, know what social media accounts they have and monitor them for privacy, especially their privacy settings. I know platforms you'll see in the news like Facebook, they have settings for privacy and they can sometimes be complicated. Work with your kids, figure out how to lock down their sites so that only their friends and not all these strangers have access to their information. Um, teach them not to share and post information that's personal. So don't post your address. I've seen that happen, unfortunately. Don't post pictures of yourself in your school uniform because now your friends and strangers might know where you go to school. Um, limit the posting of videos and photos. Predators and cyber bullies are a real problem and videos and photos are unfortunately their fuel. So the more that your children are posting all that online, it's giving more enticement to those bad guys that could do bad things. Um, Teach your kids to be cautious in making online purchases. <laughs> I know of a few friends whose children have got onto their Amazon accounts and just went crazy buying stuff, but that's usually a safer platform. But there are other platforms that maybe aren't as secure and your children are putting in their financial information into these unsecure sites and the P PHI, PFI, which is the type of PII is suddenly in the wrong hands. Um, phishing, I know we have a cyber audience here today. Phishing is also a big issue um, with children. So just teaching your children to be weary and not trust everything you see and definitely don't click on everything you see. Um, but overall, just teach them about it. Let them know what privacy is. Tell them how to set those privacy, privacy settings and don't overshare or talk to strangers. Um, like Julie mentioned earlier, there are some laws in place to help with this, like COPA, um, to help protect personal information on websites and online services, including applications. But it's also up to us as parents, as professionals to teach our next generation what it means to protect our privacy. So. Okay. Next, we'll talk a bit about the future of privacy. Kathy, you want to talk first about recent laws and guidance? Um, yes. So uh, there are there have been some laws put in place recently uh, within the past couple of years 
uh, to actually enhance privacy protections. And uh, to some extent, we can thank big tech for this. Uh, it became clear uh, through some interesting um, scenarios that big tech was creating, was collecting a lot more information, PII, that pe than people and governments realized and sharing that PII. And so one of the results of that was the European Union's uh, data, general data protection regulation. And the interesting thing about that is, yes, it, it, it applies to the EU, but it also applies um, to MITRE or companies who are trying to market to the uh, to, to residents of the EU. And so it's also, it, it, because it's residents versus citizens, um, it has more applicability than, than um, you may first assume given the, the fact that it applies to the EU. So um, it has some very unique perspectives in terms of what it offers. Um, you can thank the GDPR for all the cookie policies that you stumble across as you go from website to website. Um, and the, e, the GDPR requires these cookie policies. It also requires the ability for individuals um, to opt out of non-essential cookies. So um, its default position is actually pretty protective. Uh, likewise, it provides data subjects, uh, those people who are providing PII with uh, rights in terms of accessing their PII, uh, understanding, in fact, lots of companies regardless of what you do, there are now um, you know, uh, services out there so that you can request, send a blanket statement out requesting uh, a company provide you with PII that they have about you. Um, and so you can request that information, you can try to modify that information, you can request that it be deleted uh, to support the right to be forgotten. So it is a, a law that um, uh, upped the privacy protections that um, not, apply not only to the EU, but much more broadly um, across, across the globe. Um, the other uh, where the national where the country has failed to really pass a national law, even though um, there's lots of discussion about passing a national law every year, uh, states and cities have moved forward in terms of certain issues and uh, protecting individual privacy. So one of the um, areas which gets a lot of attention attention is facial recognition, for example. There are some some counties, some cities that have uh, restricted the use of facial recognition technology. Um, for those of you in New York, uh, one of the more interesting laws they have is about uh, providing more transparency. This is one of uh, a topic near and dear to my heart, AI ethics. Um, they have a law in New York City about providing transparency relative to algorithms that are used for hiring. Um, so th the cities, the states, California Consumer Protection Act, they are stepping in where the national law has, has failed to appear yet. Um, and you know the California um, Consumer Protection Act, right now California is pretty much it, but it, there is expectation that other states will will pass similar laws, and the fact that California, has, you know, is the largest by population state, means that even though that, that many companies that may not be California based will still uh, abide by the California Consumer Protection Act. So. Uh, there are laws that are moving towards the direction of protecting privacy. And yes, there are some grumblings by businesses that this impedes business. So, um, so should we move on to the ADPPA? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Kathy. Um, 
really just wanted to mention this because you've probably seen this in the news. There is a uh, proposed comprehensive privacy law in the U.S., one of many we've seen proposed over the years. So we'll see if this one passes. It's called the American Data Privacy and Protection Act, or ADPPA. And it is a law that has many of the areas that you saw in the FIPS, the Fair Information Practice Principles that Megan talked about. It has requirements for data minimization. It also has requirements for privacy by design and all the other uh, consumer data rights that you would find in GDPR and also in the CCPA. So it looks like a promising law, but we'll, we'll see if it gets passed. So keep your eyes on that. It's something to look to see it might help us with privacy in the future. Um, Megan, you're next. Sure, and I'll keep it fast because I know we want to save some time for um, some questions. So with the expanded integration of privacy with data management and data governance, we've talked a lot about these different technologies, um, and especially in this era, era of big data where vast amounts of information is collected and correlated to bring forward new innovation solutions and things like cures to disease. Um, and as they get more sophisticated and more data is collected and correlated, privacy risks will continue to increase. And at the, privacy, at the heart of privacy is data, or PII, as we've discussed. But having a strong grasp on your organization's PII inventory and the data flow and the use of that PI is essential to protect it. And being able to identify this inventory data flow and use requires extremely strong integration with data governance and management efforts. So as we move forward into the future and even happening now, especially in the federal government, we're seeing a much stronger coordination between our chief privacy officers and their organization and the chief data officers with CDOs and their organizations partnering to appropriately govern, manage and protect data, particularly the PII. Um, you'll see CDOs are working closely with CPOs to build privacy into their data policies and strategies. We've worked on a few of those as of recently. Um, and the CPOs are also working closely with CDOs to make sure that they, they're integrating enterprise data governance coordination into their privacy policies and strategies. So just a, a continued yet even more enhanced strong connection between those two organizations because it really is about the data and the PII and protecting it. So they need to be pretty joint, jointly connected at the hip. I'll pass it on for the metaverse conversation. Okay, just a little bit about privacy in the metaverse. Of course, everyone's talking about the metaverse. It's the next new big thing. The key thing to understand about it is that there are a lot of sensors that are used in the metaverse that capture a lot of information that's personally identifiable information, your gait, your facial expressions, your um, you know, movement of your body, your everything about you, basically. All kinds of PI gets joined together. So they can tell a lot about you and create all kinds of content that's specific to those things about you. So there are a lot of privacy considerations there. It's a great opportunity though, because it is new for them to use privacy by design and develop privacy in from the beginning. So we'll see how that works out, but keep in mind if you're going to use the metaverse that there are a lot of privacy considerations there. So the last slide we wanna talk just for a couple minutes about working as a privacy professional. First off, a little bit about how we got started in the profession. Um, I'll just start really quick. Um, when I got out of college and I took my first job, I went to work for the Department of Defense as a civilian employee, and they actually hired me to work on personnel systems. I had a background in computers as well as a degree in psychology. And I used that psych degree every day in my work in privacy. Um, but I really had a strong interest forever in cybersecurity and privacy. So I moved over into the cyber area and eventually really focused mostly on privacy um, and throughout the years have really maintained that. I've spent most of my time in cyber and privacy working together, but recently more in privacy. Um, so you can get started in privacy from pretty much any area that you'd like to work in. You don't have to have a law degree. None of us here on this um, presenting today have law degrees, although you will find a lot of emphasis on compliance in the private sector and a lot of attorneys who work in privacy. Um, Megan, how about you? Yeah, mine's kind of untraditional as well. I, I went to college with a, got a bachelor's degree in integrated science and technology with a concentration in biotechnology, which really doesn't have much to do with privacy other than, you know, biometrics is a big thing. So I get, I get to dabble in it here and there. But I started out my career as a, um, an engineer, not even a cyber engineer. I was doing systems engineering and I kind of fell into cybersecurity did that for a few years, um, doing a lot of system accreditations or authorizations. And then there, I went to a company where they suddenly decided that they were going to send a whole bunch of people to um, a conference and we're going to get our 
IAPP, CIPPG certifications. And at that point in my career, it's like I knew what privacy was, but I wasn't strong in it. Um, and I went to the conference and I just fell in love with it. And that's kind of how my privacy career got started. I was an engineer by trade, um, science kind of girl. And then that's when I just started focusing more and more on privacy. I still do a lot of cyber strategy work today, but having both of those hats on has made it a lot more successful because as Julie alluded to in a previous slide, there's such a tight integration needed between cyber and privacy. You can have privacy, but you need cyber to help protect all that data. So it's been a, it's been a fun career. Um, I learn a lot every single day, as you've seen, <laughs> there's a lot happening and it's always changing. So it's kept me on my toes. What about you, Kathy? Oh, my my story is a lot a lot quicker. Um, I was doing cybersecurity, and I worked at an insurance company. And all of a sudden, HIPAA hit our doorstep, and they said, "Well, who wants to be responsible for HIPAA and our our, our our IT systems?" And I didn't step back quickly enough, so it ended up being me. And so I had to really ramp up and under the whole <laughs> company had to ramp up and figure out what this HIPAA thing meant to us. So it was very interesting. It was, you know, it was an interesting team endeavor uh, to figure out what corporately we had to do because of HIPAA. Okay, great. Thanks. And um, just want to mention um, the professions about evenly split between men and women. And if you're very interested in getting privacy training, um, the International Association of Privacy Professionals has a course, it's a foundational course. I led the development of it and I teach the course. So if you go to the link that's on the screen, find out about the course, it's very inexpensive. It's a one day course. You can learn a lot, about more, a lot more about privacy. And with that, I think we've got a couple minutes to answer some questions. So, um, so Julie, I First can question. read. I was going to say I can read off a few of the questions if that's okay. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So the first one I, I have on the screen is: Do you recommend any privacy certifications? If so, which ones? Um, privacy professional privacy certifications. Um, yeah, IAPP has a lot of really good ones. And if you're working in the U.S. in private sector, the CIPP slash U.S. is the one that they have for. Um, private sector, I recommend that one. If you're a technologist though, and you're really more interested in privacy and technology, then I recognize, recommend getting the CIPT, which is a Certified Information Privacy Technologist Certification. If you take the foundations class first, you can find out more about all those different certifications and figure out which one's the best for you. I agree. Those are good ones. Okay, any other questions? We're at time. So thanks for the opportunity to uh, speak. Uh, we really enjoyed it and uh, um, hope that you learned something from today's presentation. And let us know if you have any questions. Thanks, everyone.